Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to this event. Welcome to NUPE and this event on the small states facing the EU, the case of Swiss EU relations. My name is Ulf Svadrup. I'm the director of uh, the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Um, uh, I would just like to uh, remind you all that you can, of course, participate in the discussion today, and you can do that by uh, using the chat function, uh, and that chat function is already open. Let me also say that this uh, seminar uh, is part of Nor uh, NUPI's uh, series of Europe seminars and uh, sponsored by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, the topic, as you know, of this seminar today is about Switzerland and Switzerland's relationship to the EU. I think that we in Norway should pay more attention to uh, Swiss EU relations in uh, particular. Uh, because they uh, are also important in or bet in uh, improving our understanding of how small states, more in general, can relate to the EU. And also uh, in Norway, there's an ongoing discussion of Norway's mode of association to the EU. And uh, in some sense, the Swiss solution is also part of that discussion. Although that discussion is often based not on a always fully updated understanding of the current situation or modalities of Swiss relationship to the EU, nor are these uh, discussions or references to Switzerland uh, situated in a kind of forward looking idea about how they are evolving. So the topic today uh, will be to shed a bit more light on the nature and dynamic in the Swiss EU relationship and also to reflect on how and to what extent there are similarities and differences between Norway and the EU in uh, Norway and Switzerland in their relationship to the to the EU. Uh, we are joined today by two excellent experts. First, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Michael Ambul. He's a professor for negotiation and conflict management at the Federal Council Institute, ETH, in Zurich. Before that, he had a diplomatic and political career, including as State Secretary for Foreign Affairs. He, is, he was playing an important role in negotiations of several of the key agreements between Switzerland and the EU and agreements on issues related to banking, secrecy and taxation with the US and other countries. And uh, Michel Ambil uh, will also reflect a bit on the current negotiations and what is the likely outcome of these. Uh, uh, after the initial remarks by Michel Ambil, uh, we will uh, invite uh, our uh, NUPI colleague, uh, Arne Melchior, a senior research fellow at NUPI, who has worked extensively on uh, Norway's relationship with Europe uh, to reflect on a few of, of the topics that Michel Ambil brings up. And uh, I should also say that uh, uh, Arne Melchior also just published a book on uh, the Norwegian seafood industry and its relationship to Europe. And in that book, he also reflects on the EEA and the alternative modes of association between Norway and the EU. So he's most qualified to engage in that discussion. So without further ado, I would just like to welcome the two of our speakers and in particular Michel Ambil, uh, and I will hand the floor over to you. Please, Michel, great to have you with us and hope everything is nice in Switzerland. And now I look forward to hear your views and perspectives. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Director, dear Ulf, uh, dear Arne, uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and, uh, and friends. Uh, I hope you hear me well from Zurich. OK, uh, let me first thank you very, uh, very much for uh, this kind introduction and uh, this excellent initiative you, you have taken up to uh, <clears throat> have this webinar seminar. I would also like to congratulate Arne for the newly published book which I did not read yet, not due to a lack of time, but to a lack of Norwegian knowledge. And uh, but uh, uh, from the outset, it looks very nice and interesting. 
So without further introduction, I would, if it's OK for you, go into my slides, which I would like to share with you and um, can I uh, can you see them also nicely? Yes, it works well. OK, very good. So uh, I will uh, give you a short overview in the sense of what did we in the past, what is current and what could be the future of our uh, relationship with, uh, with the European Union. And I very much agree with you, Ulf, that uh, it is very interesting to compare uh, the two cases. Uh, of course, we have not the same institutional setup with, with uh, uh, the European Union. You are in the EA, we are not in the EA. Uh, and uh, we have, of course, a, a different uh, geographical situation. But having said this, we are very much in similar situations regarding negotiation uh, situation, how to deal with uh, a friendly but big neighbor, uh, namely the European Union. I would like to um, uh, structure the past, uh, past, uh, present and future, and I start with the past. Give you a very rapid historical overview. It will be brief. Uh, I would like to start saying that already in the 1950s, also Switzerland observed rather observed rather um, uh, carefully the what I would call now the European project. Uh, but for political reasons, especially also after the Second World War, where the neutrality had in Switzerland a very high value. Um, uh, Switzerland thought an EU accession or an accession rather at the, at, the, at the then European institution would not be possible. I think there was a political consensus in my country and Switzerland didn't want uh, to, to uh, seat on the decision making power and didn't want to go into a customs union, uh, which came later uh, and um, in, in the European uh, system. At the same time, the Swiss were already always interested in an economic cooperation, a collaboration on political uh, reasons. No, but economic collaboration would have been welcome. Uh, the Swiss tried three made three attempts to enter into a, a sort of an association agreement with the with the, uh, the uh, six member states, uh, but failed. Uh, it was always in parallel with the British attempts to become member of, of the uh, Union. And uh, it was uh, General de Gaulle who, who vetoed, as we know, uh, the UK participation. It was then only 1973 when the Brits and the Danes went out of EFTA and became together with Ireland uh, uh, member states of the European Union that we, the remaining EFTA countries, could conclude a free trade agreement. So the free trade agreement was then sort of an association agreement. Then in 1989, uh, Commissioner Delors launched the idea of a European economic area. Uh, I think the Swiss government thought that's exactly something we should go for because it is not political, it's rather economic. Nevertheless, in 92, the Swiss voters rejected, however narrowly, uh, uh, the accession to the EA agreement. And uh, so we are, since 92, not member of the uh, European Economic Area. We negotiated then sort of a, a, a parallel way, uh, uh, we would call it the bilateral way, the bilateral avenue, negotiations of bilateral one, a package of seven, seven agreements. Uh, that was negotiated and they came later into force in 2000 and then was a second package of uh, nine agreements in the package bilateral two. And since a couple of years, there is a discussion about the so-called institutional framework. That is not finished yet. These negotiations 
are not finished, they have been interrupted and that they will start uh, soon again, but they, they are in a, yeah, in a rather difficult situation. So that's the overview of what we have so far done. Now, the next point, where are we now? Um, I always like to start with the map of Europe. Uh, you, you see uh, the, 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 the tiny Switzerland here in the middle of Europe, surrounded, if I may say so, by European Union member states, except Liechtenstein, very tiny here, which is not a member of the European Union, but is of course a member of the EEA. And um, so you see this map basically explains the whole situation of Switzerland. We small, they big, we in middle, and we have to find modus vivendi to come to good solutions in the cooperation, which we have. I give you a, a very brief summary of of the numbers, uh, figures, which illustrate very well the, the, uh, the uh, reciprocal interest of both parties, now European Union and Switzerland. You see, we have 1.4 million EU citizens who live in Switzerland, and we have 330,000 commuters who come into Switzerland daily. So we are probably the country with the largest commuting community uh, within uh, Europe. Then we have, um, uh, on the other side, we have 460,000 Swiss living in the EU, and on the commuting side, there are only 29,000, uh, uh, so uh, roughly only one-tenth. And then um, if you take the trade, we have 230 billion euro trade in goods per year, uh, EU Switzerland. So in both both ways, huh? uh, import, export. Uh, if, if I may just show a comparison, the EU Mercosur with Brazil, Argentina, uh, Brazil, uh, 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 Uruguay and, and Paraguay, you see uh, with Switzerland, it's 2.5 times more than what EU Mercosur is. This is just to show uh, the importance of, of uh, the Swiss trade. And uh, we have then 2.2 uh, million people who cross the Swiss border daily. 2.2 million Swiss, no, not Swiss people, uh, people who cross the Swiss border daily. Um, that gives you uh, and then 20, some 20,000 trucks cross the Swiss border. That gives you a, a, a good impression of the situation. And that shows also that um, uh, there is a, a clear, um, a large surplus of our European friends in the relationship with Switzerland. The clear surplus, they have more people, more goods, more, more, uh, um, more trucks coming into Switzerland than we uh, the other way around. Here is a list of, I would say, the most important agreements which we have concluded so far out of uh, a list of 120 agreements. I think it's about the same amount you have in, in Norway. I just uh, have seen Norway, uh, uh, EU, we have uh, some 120. And um, you see here the list. You, it's not necessary to go through them in, in detail. I just try to categorize them a little bit. So that is what I would call the bilateral zero. That's the one who uh, uh, have been negotiated before we started the, the bilateral way after the EEA rejection. You, you see here, uh, in particular, the Free Trade Agreement of 1973, uh, which also Norway concluded at that time. We have here then the, the, the real bilateral one, uh, seven agreement, which include in particular uh, the free movement of persons, uh, land transport, and uh, uh, agriculture and MRA. These are the uh, important important 
points. They are linked together. They form one package. Then we negotiated the bilateral two. I, I could negotiate this um, uh, on behalf of the government with a, with a, a colleague of yours. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe he is he's also present. Uh, Ambassador Percy Westerlund, who was the negotiator on the EU EU side at that time, and then. Um, if he is here among us, I would uh, say hello to Percy, uh, very good memories uh, uh, to our cooperation. And then we have the bilateral three, that is what followed afterwards. If I categorize it a bit more, I would say these 10 agreements are uh, core agreement. Then I would say these five are market access agreement. They have an, a certain important now because the European Union would like to make a dynamic takeover of Aki. And then we have here the goods related agreement. So, so far what we have, what is in place and what all in all functions very well. I have to say very well. There are three advantages we have uh, with this uh, legal certainty and better market access. Uh, we have only it's only relevant for the selected policy areas. So it is a sort of a, a you, you select the policy areas where both parties, Brussels and Bern, want to have a cooperation. I think that's the main difference to the EEA where you have the whole menu. And we have a certain level of freedom regarding legislation politics that are not selected. This is very similar to, to your Norwegian case. Uh, we have the economic policy, monetary policy, taxation, taxation, very important, especially with, uh, with a, a, T, a, a VAT of 15% uh, in the European Union. If this is very high, we have only 8% in Switzerland, social policy, foreign policy, foreign trade policy, agriculture. So this is the main advantage, I would say an advantage for staying outside, staying outside the European Union. I have mentioned here three advantages. There are also three disadvantages. I just want to be, I try to be neutral. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not weighing these this different uh, uh, advantages. These advantages, the, the, the balance doesn't need to be uh, uh, zero. It can be in the one or the other way. Uh, we have, of course, no full participation in the selected policy areas. We have only a decision shaping, but not decision making. This is a clear disadvantage. It's the price for not being a member, uh, fair enough. I'm, I'm not criticizing this in uh, uh, at all. And we have, of course, no participation in the whole construction of the European Union. Fair enough. This is uh, clearly the price when you are not in. You are, you are you have no right to participate, and that is fully understood. And we have unsatisfied market access demands. So that is what I would say is is our our system. All in all, we have a very strong de facto integration. I would like to insist on this very strong de facto integration in the sense that probably no other European Union country is more integrated with their neighboring countries, being uh, Belgium with the, Net with the Netherlands or Germany with Austria. We are, as the numbers in the beginning have shown you, very strongly integrated. What is missing in the integration is, of course, the institutional, the political integration, as we are not a member of the EU, EEA, and even less of the European Union. We have excellent bilateral agreements and good relations. I, I would say so. I don't think we have, we are a problematic country. I, I always say this to my European Union friends. I mean, we are really not the problematic. We have here or there sometimes a bit uh, strange opinions on, on how to protect X or Y or Z, but all in all, we have no, there are no questions about uh, uh, rule of law. There are no questions about the monetary question, about indebtedness, about uh, foreign policy. Uh, you, you all know what I, I, I uh, uh, suggest here. So we are a non-problematic country 
probably as non-problematic as you in Norway. I mean, you're not really posing any, any problem to Brussels. Uh, um, then I would say, this is now my personal opinion I uh, put here. I'm talking as a, as a professor, not as a, a diplomat. I was diplomat. J just to be precise, Ulf, uh, I'm, I'm only a professional. I was always a professional. I was not a politician. Huh? Uh, I, I'm not member of a party. I, I was not. I was a, a normal civil servant. Uh, so the EU membership is, at according to me, uh, not an option. I would say the main argument against membership in Switzerland. That's my uh, opinion. Uh, I underline is uh, the direct democracy system we ha have here. And this system is, I would say, very popular. From left to right, from red to green to blue to yellow, it is, it's not contested. And if we would join, there would be, uh, we would not have to abolish it. We would not, I'm not saying this, but there would be, of course, some changes necessary because you cannot join and then say, OK, uh, however, this new directive, we have first to put to vote and we'll see whether the Swiss agree or not. I mean, if you are there, in the European Union, you have to follow. That's the rule and we would have to follow. Fair enough. There are new challenges. The institutional arrangements should be updated and new market access agreement. So that is the update is necessary. The institutional framework agreement, that is the one which is under negotiation, uh, it came to a stop two years ago. It was then Corona and also referenda in Switzerland who, who delayed again the whole uh, system. Um, so in November, exactly two years ago, uh, the uh, institute frame, uh, IFA uh, negotiation outcome is submitted to the council and the EU Commission uh, and in in Switzerland there was then a, a consultation and a, a year ago uh, the government came to the conclusion that we need clarifications in this draft text. Uh, it's a draft text, it's not initialed and even less um, signed and, and of course not adopted at all. So uh, there would be questions about uh, uh, wage protection, huh? um, uh, dumping, uh, to, to uh, avoid dumping. This is a very important point to our uh, trade union. The trade unions are, are, are a bit, uh, yeah, they are very anxious to, to have here a very clear um, uh, clarifications in order to have this wage protection. Uh, then uh, there are questions about the state aid, not in the sense as our British friends are discussing it. They also have in their Brexit uh, negotiations uh, at state aid. Here the problematic is rather that the, the cantonal banks and insurance uh, company uh, have some special ruling, so they are a bit afraid for good or bad reasons. I don't go into it. And then, uh, then it's the citizen rights directive, which is also uh, of some concern. So these are the three points which have to be discussed. They are not yet finished the discussion. They are about to take up. Uh, I would say there are further crucial discussion points. Uh, the dispute settlement, uh, the, the draft agreement foresees an involvement of the European Court of Justice. This might have a perception, a political perception in Switzerland, which is, is not in all circles uh, ideal. Uh, it is uh, so the key word we uh, some parties use here. These are the foreign judges. Uh, that is the, the, the political um, uh, keyword, schlagwort, foreign judges. We don't want for foreign judges. Uh, I, I insist it is a question mostly of 
perception, political perception. P perception is, of course, not unimportant if you have to win a referendum and you have your own experiences with referenda you're in, in Norway. Uh, then the principle in the adoption of new legislation, meaning sort of having uh, a sort certain automaticity, a dynamization of taking over new legislation, legislation you don't know. I think this is important and I believe uh, we have most likely to accept this. And then we have uh, the termination clause, which makes it almost unimpact, which is a guillotine clause, famous uh, Brussels guillotine clause, which makes it probably unlikely that you can ever terminate this institutional agreement, because if you terminate it, the whole bilateral system falls down. The core agreement will automatically fall down. That makes it difficult. The internal approval procedure is signing. We have not yet. Then the parliament and then um, popular referendum with most likely double majority. So it is a compulsory referendum, meaning the population and the uh, 26 cantons have to accept uh, uh, this, this new agreement if it is signed and put to vote. Coming to the end, the future, I think independent of the outcome of this uh, negotiation, our objective, the Swiss objective should be to continue to have a good neighborhood policy, a partnership with the European Union built on solidarity in which Switzerland together with the EU and uh, of course uh, Norway is, is there also very prominent as plays a very important role in, in mediation, peace, uh, peace promotion in democracy and human rights in the world that Switzerland supports the EU in mastering the challenges of our time, the global challenges, climate, pandemic, uh, poverty, and then uh, that both sides grant each other market access on the basis of this bilateral treaty, this framework treaties, and cooperate in important fields like security, migration, research. And this should be based ideally on a institution framework agreement, which brings in a solid little base for the whole bilateral way, the bilateral way, as we call it here, a platform for a political dialogue, and thirdly, the basis for a possible extension of the set of the agreements. Um, we hope that this negotiation can be concluded in such a way that the result has a good probability to be accepted in a Swiss popular vote, in this referendum. I mean, if the referendum is no, it's gone. Uh, and and I, I fear then we have a, a, a very difficult time for maybe another 10 years. If the assessment is such that this probability is rather low, then we should check what alternative options we have. And I'm here very clearly on my personal level. Huh? I'm, I'm now... Uh, talking to you as a, a strange professor at this ETH. So I'm not, uh, this is not government position, what I'm telling you now. I, according to me personally, one option could be that the Swiss and the EU stop the negotiation, the current, and conclude a, a cooperation interim agreement on the basis of the following terms. The Swiss support the EU cohesion, Green Deal, Corona measures with a substantial financial contribution, substantially increased compared to what we have, to come on a level of, if I may say so personally, of Norway. Uh, then to have new bilateral agreements only when the new, a new draft is successfully finished, and the, 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 this negotiation of a new uh, institutional framework agreement should start at the latest X years. 
I don't want to say X how much it is, but uh, maybe it is uh, it's a couple of years and then we start again. That is my um, introduction, my proposal, and uh, uh, I'm very happy to answer all your questions. I, I hope I can answer them and I would give back to you both. I think I have now to to get out and um, stop sharing it. Oh, this is yes. excellent. excellent. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe you can you mute can yourself, yourself Michel. Michel. Uh, uh, and Arna also. also. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Give the floor to you. But the, the, just to the, say, the, say that uh, thank you so much for these excellent remarks. I think they present uh, a very good start of a, of a conversation discussion on some of the key topics. One of the striking things that you you present very clearly is on the one hand uh, very deep uh, economic uh, societal and of course uh, geographic integration of Switzerland uh, with the EU. And at the same time, you you portray some of the difficulties in negotiating or designing the institutional arrangements uh, that uh, that uh, has also been a big issue, of course, in Norway. I think uh, uh, the observation from a huge Europe review that Norway conducted in 2010 to 2012 was more or less the same. Is basically that. Uh, European integration as such is not that contested, but some of the difficulties relates to the particular institutional design and how to facilitate on the one hand a dynamic evolution of the arrangement and also of course how to secure homogeneity or trust uh, that uh, all parties respect and play according to the same rules. And, uh, and principles and uh, and there the, the EU has been advocating or they have they reported that they are very satisfied with the the way this is solved in the case of the EA whereas uh, they've been frustrated more in relation to to Switzerland and what you say is is basically that uh, uh, also that of course these negotiations are very protracted in time cumbersome and and difficult uh, so this is lots of things that we'll, i would like to return to when we discuss but first uh, before we do that let me give the floor to arna melchior to to uh, to make some comments to this excellent introduction by michael lambil please arna the floor is yours Okay, can you hear me and see? Yeah, my... now I can hear you. Excellent. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambul, for this excellent review and assessment of the Swiss EU relations. <clears throat> As Ulf said, uh, this is part of a NUPIS Europe series. It's also linked to a book launch activity uh, about this book we recently published on, on the EEA, unfortunately, as you said, in Norwegian. Um, so I'll make some comments to your presentation and also draw on some of the conclusions from this book. But let me first also apologize to our listeners that we had a technical problem at the start of the seminar. So, uh, so for those who lost some of the early minutes, uh, the, the, the seminar will be uh, recorded and available on NUPIS YouTube uh, channel. So you can find it on NUPIS uh, webpage in entirety. So in this book um, that we published a couple of weeks ago, uh, we reviewed uh, uh, different areas of the EEA and uh, cooperation with the EU. I also wrote a historical chapter on 50 years of Norway-EU trade negotiations, issue linkages and bargaining power. We also address Switzerland in the introductory chapter, uh, and we are very glad to hear that you come here and present this uh, and go deeper into the matter and tell you what's the uh, current situation. Of course, uh, Switzerland is very interesting in the context of negotiations with the EU. It, uh, Switzerland is part of the EFTA, but not part of the EEA, 
that in the bargaining history, Switzerland has been important uh, uh, in, in the Norwegian relation to the EA as well. <clears throat> also, of course, uh, Switzerland illustrates the most advanced alternative to the EEA, unless uh, you cannot um, join as a member. Uh, actually, there is a third uh, uh, third uh, relevance, which I'll revert to at the end, is that uh, Switzerland could, of course, join the EEA. And the question is, is that out of question uh, in the foreseeable future? Um, in this project and book, we also wanted to promote uh, non-partisan information on important issues about the European integration. Uh, information and debates tend to be a bit frame, framed. Um, uh, so as researchers, we can be uh, kind of uh, a freer and contribute uh, and by being less politicized. So, uh, first, um, you mentioned that Switzerland has more than 100 agreements, uh, and this curve uh, on the right shows the number of Norwegian uh, treaties or agreements with the EU. The exact number depends a bit on how you count, but uh, with this uh, method used here, we find that it increased from 1 in 1973, the free trade agreement, to uh, 96 in 2019. And as a kind of backgrounder here, it's important to, to observe these uh, three steps of European integration, where you first had the, the kind of old, old style free trade agreements uh, with the agreements, free trade agreements from 73. The second step was the, uh, the internal market. Uh, and, and, the, uh, and the last step is from the internal market to the multi area European cooperation. So uh, integration takes many forms and actually the forms of governance vary a lot across fields uh, from the old fashioned tariff cuts and liberalizations at the border, uh, the judicial governance through uh, in, for example, competition policy, uh, the link governance in, for example, police cooperation, uh, joint programs such as research, a regular it, regulatory cooperation with extensive second, secondary legislations, for example, veterinary rules, uh, which are pr produced in large numbers, and common bureaucratic institutions such as um, uh, railway cooperation. So the question is, how do we cope with it in, uh, in these different areas? And I will here focus on the negotiation aspects uh, that I wrote about, which take place in many fields. So one uh, major issue is about the bargaining power of EFTA, uh, because EFTA, as you see from the graph on the right, showing the EU EFTA size ratio uh, from 1960 until 1992, EFTA was a kind of equal partner uh, with the EU. Uh, but uh, of course, when, when uh, Sweden, Finland, Austria joined the EU, the size of EFTA uh, dropped and Switzerland left the EEA. So, um, so the, uh, the, uh, the, the upper curve shows uh, that EU has become 90 times larger than the EA, th the three EFTA countries being part of the EA. If you uh, add Switzerland, we come to this green curve on GDP. Uh, uh, EFTA is relatively more important, but still uh, EU is more than 40 times larger. But here, if you add Switzerland, we get down to uh, 16, 17 times larger. So, so uh, a more significant partner. So, uh, but this asymmetry in size means that outsiders could have more to lose if negotiations fail, fail as, uh, as written, as observed by, for example, Krugman, 1979. Uh, I'm sure, Mr. Abel, that uh, the, the, in your negotiation studies, uh, this is a, 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 an important point. So a lesson from Norway EU negotiations is that coalitions matter. Uh, so EFTA was very important for the EEA negotiations uh, around 1990. The Nordic coalition was important when Norway joined Schengen uh, from 1995. And even when there were contradictions and different uh, business interests within the group, for example, EFTA, uh, they, these, uh, the coalitions were important for the results. Um, so there were long discussions within EFTA when the EA was negotiated, but still EFTA was crucial for the outcome. 
A second uh, conclusion from this history is that policy objectives, reason and arguments matter. So it's not like haggling in a fish market. So the internal market was strongly influenced by the plan and the plan of the internal market and the vision of Jacques Delors. Uh, the implications of eastward enlargement in 2004 were uh, kind of important strategic uh, implications that affected negotiations. The uh, question is, uh, is whether EFTA is well enough prepared uh, in this uh, sense that they focus on the kind of broad, uh, um, uh, broad ambitions and goals of negotiations. The, 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 the analysis also shows that policy interference in negotiations had mixed outcomes and you can read in the book chapter about how Norwegian uh, ministers uh, um, uh, contributed in various uh, uh, negotiations. I don't have time to go into that now. Looking at the EEA grants to economic and social cohesion, you see the curve here uh, where with the increase over time for Norway, uh, in, counted in Euro or inflation adjusted and also Switzerland in the gray bars columns here, showing that, uh, that uh, the Norwegian average annual contribution is much higher and it has increased over time. So they were supposed to be temporary, but they were extended uh, in 1999 after tough negotiations, 2004, a tenfold increase related to uh, uh, EU Eastern enlargement uh, and gradual increases later Switzerland, as you see, paid less and you have details about the bargaining in the book. So the conclusion is that the unequal bargaining power contributed to this 4-1 to Goliath, as I write in this book, but bargaining skills and strategies also matter. Uh, in the EEA negotiations, you have very strong issue linkages. Uh, for example, for Norway, uh, the market access for seafood, uh, agriculture, EEA grants and resor fish resources were linked in the end game of the 1991 negotiations. In the EEA, negotiations have later been separated and routinized in different tracks. So there is no link between, uh, no apparent link or strong link between, let's say, uh, market access for seafood versus agriculture. And even these uh, regular negotiations on EEA grants and seafood, uh, there have been weak links between the two themes, so the market access for the seafood and the uh, EEA grants. Uh, the uh, history also shows that domestic policy constraints can increase bargaining power, but also be a kind of two-edged sword by uh, creating political complications. I think uh, Switzerland has experienced that uh, uh, strongly. Perceptions of the negotiators also matter. Uh, is the EEA at risk and do you have to be careful and how tough can you be? So analysis and strategic approach is important. So what's the implication of this um, historical review for the Swiss EU context. Uh, so, um, uh, so in the book, uh, in the book chapter, I write that EU membership will reduce sovereignty by, but on the other hand, increase influence by allowing coalitions, for example, with former with Nordic partners, and participating in a system where small countries punch above their weight, according to the research on voting power in, in the EU. Uh, also conclude that uh, negotiating a Swiss solution from scratch is currently a risky option because of the uneven bargaining power. And of course, uh, the current situation also illustrates some kind of uh, problems with the Swiss model. Uh, so broader coalitions of non-EU countries, for example, Norway, Switzerland, and UK would help but are not on the agenda. But this is kind of a main question here. Uh, I could uh, is EA membership off the table for Switzerland, or could it become relevant in the future? For example, if the current future negotiations with the EU turn out to be very complicated, could the EA be a kind of quick fix for sector coverage and participation, or is that politically impossible in Switzerland for the foreseeable future? 
Uh, I think for both countries, 2021 will be very interesting. I speak about Switzerland and Norway and the other EA participants, because uh, for Norway, for example, EA grants will be uh, renegotiated uh, together with the seafood market access. But you also have the Green Deal, Brexit and COVID-19 in the background with a 750 million euro uh, package in the EU. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned in your presentation that uh, Switzerland could consider a significantly larger contribution to cohesion uh, and the relevance of the Green Deal. And I think the Norwegian foreign minister actually a couple of days ago in a presentation said that the Green Deal would be uh, kind of link, uh, relevant in the context of the EA grant negotiations in 2021. So this will be new interesting and probably tough negotiations where we would have to draw on the experiences from earlier uh, history and negotiations. So, but so uh, let me finish with this question. Can the Switzerland ever join the EEA? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, uh, Arna. Maybe you can take down the slides and that, so now we can see you all. Uh, excellent. Thank you so much to, for two very interesting and good presentations. Uh, so uh, then I'll just pass the floor right away over to you, Michael uh, Ambul. Uh, can Switzerland join the EEA uh, or is that completely off the agenda? Thank you for this uh, question. Uh, you hear me again? Yes, yes. <clears throat> I think personally the EEA is an excellent solution and uh, it is, I was uh, uh, personally uh, as, as a representative of, of the Swiss government, I was very much in favor of it. Uh, I, uh, theoretically Switzerland could, could of course always ask you, uh, the EEA member countries, if we could join. Uh, but probably it is the fact that we are not now for 30 years not in the EEA and we have had so far good experiences with the bilateral system. We are in a way accustomed now, accustomed to the bilateral system. It's maybe like an old couple after 30 years of, of marriage, you're no more going to divorce and say, no, this bilateral thing is not good enough. Let's, let's change the whole system. Um, I would say, but I'm once again not a politician, and it is a political question, but I don't see as now an observer in Switzerland a big movement in favor of joining the EEA. Also, I believe in Switzerland the EEA has a lot of sympathy and uh, we are of course uh, very fond of cooperating with countries like you or Iceland, Liechtenstein, and of course with the Brussels people, uh, they are all in the EEA. And um, uh, I, I, but I don't think that it is currently an an option. But you can never exclude that. Exclude that maybe things change. I would also, if I, as I have already the floor, as diplomats normally say when they want to add something which was not asked, uh, the, the question regarding the UK. UK did also not want to join EFTA. I think even Norway was a little bit sceptical. I heard once uh, that the foreign minister of Os from Oslo said, well, if the UK would join the EFTA and the EA, we, the Norwegian, would no more be the big champions because then there will be another guy who, who will say what, what, what is, is the, the right view to look at. Uh, and so the Brits did not want to, change, to join and they don't want the Swiss way either. So they have chosen uh, another way of a, a trade agreement. Uh, they would like to have, as they say, a Canadian trade kind of trade agreement. Also, in the long run, we don't know whether in these days they will find a, a modest free trade agreement, a very modest trade agreement, maybe this week, maybe next week. And uh, I could imagine that this is a very unambitious uh, level, this free trade agreement, if they get any, uh, we don't know. Uh, then in the medium term, they might also want pretending this, they might also want to 
elaborate this and enlarge it. And in this way, it could it could be some kind of uh, Swiss way going step by step and making the bilateral issue more uh, larger. OK, let me pick up a bit on the, on the Brexit uh, topic because uh, uh, Brexit has, of course, generated a lot of attention in Europe uh, and in Norway and also in Switzerland, I presume. Um, it might be that some Norwegian politicians have said that they don't want to welcome the e UK into the EEA because the UK is so big. Uh, but I, 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 I think uh, I, I don't think that's the main concern. I think the main concern well, first, the UK is already or used to be a member of the EA, right? So it sure. was just a matter of switching side from the EU side to the EFTA EA side. Um, and uh, I think one of the concerns was that uh, uh, what if the UK instead of kind of continuing in the EA on the EFTA side, use these agreements to basically as a method of disintegrating from the EU rather than sticking to the purpose of kind of continuing to integrate with the EU. I think that was a bit of a uncertainty and also because the UK at that stage under Theresa May expressed clearly some ambitions that were a, a bit wider and beyond what is covered by the agreement. So it was basically not seen as very interesting. And, and uh, the UK himself, uh, themselves never expressed a desire to join the EI. So I don't think it was a serious alternative. But uh, in my understanding, and this relates, I think, also to what Arne said, the UK has been looking into Switzerland in some sense. They have been looking into uh, finding bilateral agreements in the EU, uh, trying to refrain from entering into uh, an institutional setup with uh, a court system. And has been that has been some a bit of a, kind of the red line for the Boris Johnson government. So I'm just curious if I can invite you to reflect on how how has the Swiss model, so to say, uh, been, how do you think it has been portrayed in the UK discussion? And do you see that, has, the, has Brexit some way or the other made the Swiss solution or your model stronger or weaker in the eyes of the EU, do you think? Because it's not very strongly marked on, the, on this stair, staircase uh, system of Bonnier, is it? Yes, I, I, there are the two questions. Um, did the British friends uh, also look at the Swiss case? I believe so. Uh, I can only say from me personally, I've been invited twice in the parliament, the lower and the upper house, in committees to explain the Swiss case. It was I think uh, uh, rapidly clear that they would not go for uh, a real Swiss model due to, I would say, the lack of um, uh, having the free movement of persons included. Mm. I think that is that was key. Yeah. And the Brits, for good or bad reasons, that's, that's their decision, political reasons, probably because they thought that was a, a key element for the Brexit, yes, vote was free movement of persons. So they, they said we don't want this. And with this, they would take, uh, would have not included a hardcore one pillar of the Swiss case. At least I believe our European Union friends, for them, this is absolutely key. So they do not go for this Swiss model, definitely not. And now it is certainly very modest when they achieve something uh, in the next couple of days, if at all. In the, um, the long run, it might establish a little bit this logic of adding here and there, of course, in, in the consensual way, both sides agree to have new other elements to this bilateral package. 
The other question, Ulf, did it, does it um, strengthen the Swiss model or not? It will all depend um, <clears throat> how the European Union looks at this different different ways and I think the European Union and I advi admire them for this Cartesianic way of looking to have not too many different systems and maybe there would be some reflection could be made about um, the partnership, the, the, the continental partnership that was in, in August uh, 2016 was a, a, a nice, according to me, a nice presentation by a couple of European uh, scholars, uh, a continental partnership and maybe in the very long run, uh, maybe I will be then already for a long time dead, the question, is there not a coherent system to work with all these European, Un European countries like Norway, the Brits, the Swiss, uh, Ukraine, Turkey, uh, Belarusia, to include them in a continental partnership and you have then some sort of concentric circles, uh, geometry variable, uh, but in a Cartesianic system, which is of course missing so far. Uh, I agree on that, uh, and I think this is, this is a big issue. That, uh, but it will take some time because the time is not ripe as as these negotiations uh, with the UK are still not uh, concluded. But Arne, you want to jump in, please? Yes, I think uh, yeah, I think uh, Switzerland has a prominent place in the staircase of Barnier, just after the EA, as one of the most advanced forms. We used it as an illustration in the book, but I think it's important to recall that. Uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the governance uh, needs are very different in different areas of, of uh, integration. So, so that's a big change in European integration that you had the FTA in 73, you don't need uh, global governance for tariffs. Then you had the internal market, you need more. And then now you have uh, police cooperation and uh, research and whatever you, uh, and 140 agreements. So the point is that um, uh, the, in addition to migration, the Brits cannot take uh, legal homogeneity uh, because of, they want to take back control. But it's important to emphasize that this is not some, something that uh, relates to all fields. It, it, it for veterinary standards, you have thousands of new laws or secondary legislation all the time. So you need an apparatus to maintain the homogeneity. But you don't need that for tariffs and you don't need that for uh, most of the other areas of cooperation. So I think it's important to decompose this thing to uh, have a sensible debate on what kinds of integrations are possible. And well, I think the Brits have to need some time to reflect. But if you want a common uh, control on food standards, for example, you have to accept some uh, this homogeneity. And Switzerland is the case. Uh, of this. So yes, so decompose the problem, maybe then give UK some time and in the future, maybe new solutions. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I see we're running out of time, so I have to come to an end soon, but let me uh, bring up a, a final point. Uh, we have discussed, I think, so far three elements. The first is that you observe the complexity and and uh, and uh, and uh, some of the scale uh, of, of the agreements between the EU and non-members such as Norway and, uh, and Switzerland. We have uh, covered a bit of the variation and differences between Norway and Switzerland and we have also basically recognized that there are lots of similarities in the sense that uh, uh, there, there are some key general issues there uh, in terms of uh, dense integration, but at the same time, some of the difficulties related to representation and institutional arrangement. But let us, uh, in the final minute, uh, turn to uh, a more global issue. You, Michel Ambil, you, you mentioned briefly in some of your remarks that uh, in, the, in the case that the FTA will not no, the the the, the, frame, uh, in, uh, the institutional sure. framework agreement will not be con concluded. Um, you basically argued that uh, Switzerland will have an ambition to cooperate with the EU in a range of topics. 
uh, and you mentioned the Green Deal, but you also mentioned peace and and foreign policy. And you also said that uh, Switzerland uh, has, of course, over time changed a bit of its foreign policy outlook and view. Uh, this is a long introduction to the question of China. Uh, because China has complete uh, a free trade agreement with Switzerland. Norway is currently negotiating its free trade agreement with the EU. At the same time, we are in a, in a space in time where Europe and the US are seriously rethinking its relationship with China. So how do you view Switzerland's relationship with China? And do you see some kind of increased, let's say, dialogue between Switzerland on one side and the EU on the other in how to relate to China? I'm thinking about property rights, uh, level playing field, technology transfer, and all these new linkages between security on the one hand and, and economic policy and technology on the other. Uh, it's of course a very difficult uh, question because it's not easy to to analyze in what direction uh, China will will go. But I'm very much sure that it is very important that the Swiss, the Bern, and Brussels uh, have have an exchange of views, or rather, uh, to be modest, that we we uh, check what their views are on the European on on China. And uh, that uh, we we get inspiration from them, from Brussels, how they look at it. And we have no interest at all not to play the European card, the card of the European uh, values, if I may use this. And uh, I'm sure in Oslo uh, you, you think this the same way. Um, having this free trade agreement with China is per se uh, a good thing. Uh, I still believe uh, trade in the long run is helpful for also the development of of the societies, and uh, so uh, it is. It's not counterproductive. Okay, uh, Arna, would you like to have a final brief remark? I would say that uh, Biden will likely um, 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 eliminate the trade war, but perhaps not the technology war. Uh, so, uh, so that will be a kind of challenge in the future. So, so and the European strategy of being a, a friend and an adversary at the same time is, of course, um, a challenge. But we will see how Biden changes American policies that will influence the scene very much. OK, thank you so much. Uh, time is running out. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Michel Ambul for, for joining in on this very interesting and timely conversation. And of course, to Arne Melchior also for uh, for participating. And I think that this was a, a bit of an important session in the sense that we covered not only the, the, the nature of the cooperation between Switzerland and the EU and Norway and the EU in the time that has been past or but also a bit forward looking in some of and how to relate to Europe as this new both global and European agenda and projects so to say are changing so thank you so much for joining in and also thanks I'd like to thank the audience for joining in and certainly uh, uh, we hope to to uh, to bring you all back uh, soon so we, we so we can continue this conversation thank you so much to the two of you thank you so thank much you. thank you dear colleague it was a, a pleasure to be with you thanks to all thanks